Greetings and welcome. We are at Senior English A. And our objective now for the hour is to introduce you to Jeffrey Chaucer. You ought to have your hymnals open to 94, 95, 96, 97. That's where we're going to be. And we're going to be working now with a famous, famous writer named Jeffrey Chaucer. In fact, are you ready for this? The first thing I actually want you to write down about this cat is that we often will call him the father of the English language. The father of the English language. I will make the argument that Geoffrey Chaucer is the single most important writer you will ever read in English. And here's why. He is the father of the English language. Well now, what exactly does that mean? Well, I know that you've already read some of this uh, biography that sits on page 92, 93. If you've looked at that biography at all, most importantly, the dates at the top of 92. I'm hoping you write those dates down. Notice the question mark after 1343, because birth records were not so really clear all the time. But we do believe that he died in 1400. I like an easy date of 1350 for Chaucer. 1,300 roughly years after the birth of Christ, okay, we're going to talk about this guy named Geoffrey Chaucer. Now, for a moment, imagine that this morning, Mr. Short back there woke up and he had a driving passion to want to know what the people in England of 1350 were like. He's a strange man, this is his interest. <laughs> and because he's got all kinds of money, he goes to the one place in the world where you can go and read up on stuff like this. The greatest library in the world is, of course, the Library of Congress. So he goes to D.C., <laughs> he goes to the Library of Congress, he walks in, and he says to the agent there at the front desk, I have to know about English people in 1350. Give me all you got. Believe it or not, she's going to say, we ain't got much. In fact, for your notes, we've only got about three places that you can go to get much intel on these people. The first place that you can go are what we're going to call church writers. These are priests, people within the church. But they write in Latin, and Short says, don't worry about it. I've studied in theological, I got my PhD in theology and philosophy. I can read in Latin, just give me the information. So he does, he reads the small amount that's there. Two things he's going to learn about these people for your notes. One, they smell. No, I mean it literally, they smell. These are people who live year after year, Short will find out, and they do not bathe. In fact, many of them are really superstitious about this bathing thing. When they take any kind of bath, that accumulated dirt on their skin comes off, they get sick and they die. And to that degree, many of them don't bathe. They don't like taking baths. They stink, which is why... We build these cathedral churches with lots and lots of room at the top to try to dissipate the stench, which these church fathers will say is ever-present when they all get together to come to church. Oh. Number two, these people constantly, Short's sure going to find out, these church fathers will say this, these people constantly hanky-panky, constant, like rabbits they are, <laughs> all the time. Oh. The priests say... We preach against Hanky Panky, but it does not matter. These people, constant Hanky Panky all the time. Well, Short says, all right, I get it, I get it. They smell and they Hanky Panky. But he's like, do we got anything else about these people? Well, he comes back to the lady. And she says, well, there's a second group. And the second group are the French. So you want to write that down. Second group are the French. And... She says, look, here's the deal. The French, you know, I can give you this stuff, but it's in French. And Short says, not a worry. Studied at the Sorbonne. I've got a degree in French as well. Give it to me. And so he begins to read two things he learns about these French people. By the way, the French people, after 1066 and the Battle of Hastings, the French kind of run the show. And so they are the upper class. They're the ones that run things in 1350. And the French say two things about these common people of in London in 1350. One. Uh, they stink. It says they stink. They don't know how to take baths, these people. They wallow in the mud. They stink, of course. You're familiar with that whole scene in Monty Python's Bring Out Your Dead, Bring Out Your Dead. The whole thing about the Black Plague and all of that. See, these people, they have no sense of plumbing. 
They poop in a pail. They take it outside and dump it in the street. Then they send their kids out to play out in the street. They stink. Number two. This is an interesting one for Mr. Short when he reads it. The French officials will say, these people speak a very strange language. It is a language that the French writers will say, we don't really know. It is not so much a written language as it is a spoken language, and when they talk, they stink. Now, the French don't mean that their breath stinks. That's the first one. What they mean when they talk is, literally, when they talk, this language thing that they speak, it sounds ugly. Now, if you've ever sat at an airport or someplace, and you listen to somebody speaking Italian or French or Spanish, these are what we call romance languages. They are beautiful. They are melodic languages. They come off of the tongue. They sound beautiful when they're spoken. But this language sounds more like German. For those of you who have ever studied German, it sounds like somebody's got a hairball in the back of their throat. They're trying to ha huck it up. That's, that's the sound. That's the sound. Well, come to find out, this language that they're speaking, now for your notes, is what we call a hybrid language. Now, what does that mean? A hybrid language means what? It does. It does. It's coming from multiple sources. This language that these cats speak has a little bit of Greek, a little bit of Latin, a little bit of French, a little bit of German, some Scandinavian. It, it traces its roots all the way back to a Sanskrit root. This is a strange language predominantly. It is spoken, not written predominantly. And to that degree, there are no rules about this language. There's no, for example, there's no dictionary. There's no orthography. There's no way to spell the words. It is predominantly a spoken language, and they use it in the marketplace as kind of like to go beneath the French. So, for example, the French officials don't know what they're saying. It's almost like a subverted type of language. In other words, it's almost invented to get around the French officials, and the French don't like it. Short comes back to the agent at Library of Congress and says, okay, I get it. They smell... They hanky-panky, and they stink when they talk. But I want to know things like, what do they wear? What do they eat? What are their interests? What do they do? That's what I want to know. And she says, uh, the only other place you can go for that kind of level of intel is the third place, and it's a guy named Jeffrey Chaucer. And Short says, Chaucer? What's, what, who is he? Oh, he's way important. Well, let's talk about him for a second. Who is this guy? Well, let's make a quick list. Now, you got some intel that you already read for yourself on 9293. And before you obviously take the exam, you want to really make sure you've read 9293 pretty close, just so that you know who this guy was. Let's talk about him for a second. He's a very interesting guy. In his adult life, he ends up becoming what we call today an ambassador. So you want to write that down. What does an ambassador do? He goes from one country and visits other countries and then comes back to his original country. He works for the government. One of the things that makes Chaucer so powerful as an ambassador is he speaks multiple languages. He knows Italian. He knows French. Got me? And so he's working. One of the things that happens for him is that he gets off the boat in Italy. And when he arrives, he discovers that there is a very famous popular book that has just been published. The writer of that book is a guy named Boccaccio. You don't have to worry about spelling because you're going to meet him later. And he's published a collection of stories that he calls Decameron. Decameron. Now, this Decameron, Deca means ten. This is a story of ten stories. It's a book of ten stories, Deca, Decameron. Ten stories. And the way Boccaccio sets it up is interesting. He says, in one of our Italian villages there was this terrible plague. And so all of the people quarantined themselves. Do you know what that means? You leave and go outside of the city, and you stay inside of a house, and you don't let anybody out or you don't let anybody in until all of the germs of the plague have gone away. Well, this group of people were some guys and girls who were Italians. So they all show up at this house, and because they're Italian guys and girls, you can pretty much figure out what they do first. Then after that, they decide that they need to entertain themselves with other kinds of ways. So they start telling stories. And what Boccaccio does is he tells these stories. Uh, there aren't very many of these stories that I can teach you because they are unbelievably obscene. Incredibly pornographic. No kidding. Yeah, really. And uh, the, the Italian people love it, but here's why. 
Boccaccio decides to follow the lead of the great Italian writer Dante, who had written just a few years before, and he writes in the Italian of the street people. That's what, that's important, you want to write that down. Boccaccio writes in the normal language of street people, and his Decameron becomes a phenom. Everybody's buying this book. Chaucer says to himself, I wonder if I could do something similar back home in England. He goes back to England, and he gets a job working at one of the gates of London. Now, London is a city back in Chaucer's day, 1350, that has a wall that goes all the way around it, and then only a few gates in and out of the city, and then there are people who work those gates. Do you got me? So, in other words, you can only get in or out if you've got the appropriate pass or whatever. Chaucer works at one of those gates over a number of years. And he decides, I'm going to write a very similar kind of project, like Boccaccio's Decameron, only I'm going to use English people in my story. Okay? Now, his setup runs something like this. He's going to say, I was hanging out at this bar, <coughs> ready to go down to a special town outside of London called Canterbury. Now, what's up with Canterbury? Canterbury is a very famous town in England. Why? Two reasons. One, there's a huge church cathedral there. And I mean huge. It's an unbelievable cathedral. You can visit it today. It's this amazing cathedral. Two, inside of that cathedral, many years before Chaucer, there was a very famous priest there named Thomas Beckett. You want to put that in your notes? Thomas Beckett. Becket was a very popular priest. He made a king mad. That king sent some soldiers down to Canterbury and they killed him inside of the cathedral. They jacked him inside of the cathedral because the king told him to. The people were outraged and they forced the king to have to repent and say he was sorry. The body of Thomas Becket was buried inside of that cathedral, and very quickly, that cathedral became a famous site for, an important word for your notes, pilgrimage. Now, you want to write that word down, then we're going to define it. Pilgrimage. See, now here's the funny thing. Some of you think that MTV invented the concept of spring break. Not so. That's a really old concept. In the spring, we're about to hit one, aren't we? In the spring... People like to go off and do crazy stuff and go on journeys and trips and stuff like that. But a pilgrimage is a special kind of trip. Are you ready for this? It's a religious trip. It's a religious trip. It is a trip that religious people will take. And what Chaucer will do is he sets up a scenario where a group of people are traveling from London to Canterbury. Are you ready for this? And they invite Chaucer to go with them. Okay? They invite Chaucer to go with them. On the way there, and on the way back from Canterbury, they are going to enjoin a game. Where? They all pull over to the side of the road. They break out a few uh, brewskis and beer and stuff. They drink a little ale. Then one person out of the group is going to stand up, introduce himself or herself, and tell a story. We'll use a different word, not story. We're going to use the word tale. T-A-L-E. Going to tell a story. At the end of the trip, when they all come back, there's going to be a vote about who told the best story. And then that person's going to get a big party thrown for him or her. Do you got it? Now, Chaucer makes all this up. Okay? None of this actually happens, but he's going to write like it did happen. He's going to imagine himself like the first journalist who's just kind of standing there while they talk, and he's just going to write down what they said. That's it. But before he gets to the stories, the tales, he's going to introduce us to each one of the people who is going along for this trip. That introduction we call the general prologue. You want to write that down. The general prologue. Okay? So the general prologue of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales 
is introducing the characters who go on this trip with him. And what Chaucer will do is he'll introduce them one at a time. So, for example, the first character is a knight. Remember? A knight, right? So, the knight. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the knight. Then he's going to tell us a little bit about the knight's son. Then he's going to tell us a little bit about the third person who's hanging out with the knight called a yeoman, who kind of takes care of him. Then we go on to the next character. Do you got me? Now, about these characters, I want to say two things. One, this is for your notes. One, Chaucer totally makes this up. These characters are all fictitious. He makes them up. This journey down to Canterbury never actually happened. Okay? Two, these characters naturally divide into three subgroups. You need to write these subgroups down. And as you take your notes over each one of these characters... You want to answer the question, which one of these three groups does this character belong in? Group number one, subgroup number one, those people who are religious. What do I mean by that? Well, they work for the church. Okay? They're priests, they're nuns, etc. They're monks. These are all people affiliated with the church. Do you got me? Okay? The second group. The second group are people who are what we would call upper class. They're people with bank. They're people who own land. They're people who have degrees. They're people who have more money than most people. We would call them today upper class. The third group, everybody who's left, basically middle and lower class. Okay? These are individuals who we would say work for a living. Got me? They work with their hands and stuff like that. All right? So as we meet each one of these characters in our annotation notes, we want to try to assign them to one of these three groups. It's a good way to remember them as well. Now, if you're preparing for the exam, it's very simple. You will need to know the names, if not names, titles of all of these different people. Who are they? You may not have a name, but you need to know that it's the knight. Do you got me? Then, you always want to write down three things about each one of those characters. Do you got me? So as we work through the general prologue, every time we hit a name, notice those names are all going to be italicized in your text. So for example, turn with me right now to page 98. Right? So page 98. Do you see on page 98, there at roughly line 41 or so, and at a night I therefore will begin, there was a night. Do you see it? Do you see it's italicized? Raise your hand if you don't see it. We'll make sure that you do so you know what I'm talking about. Do, do you see it? There was a knight, a most distinguished man. Do you see that? And as we move on, <coughs> notice on page 99, the first major indention there. He had his son, the knight had his son with him, a young squire. Do you see the squire? Do you see that the word is italicized? Every time there's an italicized, you want to write that down. <clears throat> That's the title of the individual. Hello? Put a note to yourself. Very important. You want to number these. How come? Because we want to answer the question, how many total are there who takes this journey with Chaucer down to Canterbury? Okay. By the way, by Chaucer's day, <clears throat> Canterbury has become kind of an interesting town where lots of people descend in the spring. Here's the deal. In the church, rumors grew up that if you walked close to where Beckett was buried and you reached out and you touched where he was buried, right? There was like a mausoleum thing over. If you touched it and you were sick, you immediately got well. Or if you were poor, you immediately got money. This rumor grows up. So over time, the town of Canterbury starts to produce all kinds of hotels, holiday inns spring, spring up, and lots of people start coming. Of course, to be able to touch you have to pay what? Money. And so the church is able to make money by charging, right, people who come on pilgrimage. And so we're, we're told that lots and lots of English people like to go down to, get down to uh, Canterbury to do this journey. What is it called? The pilgrimage. A pilgrimage. Now, for your notes, let's point out, this is where people in England went to pilgrimage if they didn't have a lot of money or time. There were two other places where people went to pilgrimage. Do you remember from your history class? What are the other two famous cities, religious cities, where Christians could go for very famous pilgrimage? What's the most famous city in all of Christianity? 
Jerusalem. Rome, Rome. Why? The Roman Catholic Church. When we're talking about the church, we're talking about Roman Catholic Church. What's the second one? Jerusalem, right? That's the second city. These two cities, where is Jerusalem? It's in the area today. Today we call Pal uh, Israel, Palestine, right? That's, that's what it was called, Palestine, Israel. That's the famous city, right? Outside that city, who was crucified? Jesus Christ was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem then becomes the second famous place, right? But we're told English people go to Canterbury for their pilgrimage because they can do it. It's a pretty safe, uh, or it's a pretty short kind of journey. It's not a safe journey, and that's why the group travels together. It's much safer to travel in a group. Now, finally, before we begin actually reading this, What's the big deal about Chaucer? So he tells some stories just like Boccaccio. Uh-uh, one other thing. And this you want to put in capital letters in your notes because it's the most important thing. Chaucer had a dilemma. What language would he write this in? Whoa, this is a, this is a pivotal moment. You want to sit up now, keep your back off the back of your chair because what we're about to talk about now becomes the most important comment we're going to make in all of English literature. Here's why. Chaucer has a choice. For example, he could write this, Canterbury Tales, he could write it in Italian. I mean, that's what Boccaccio had done. He could write it in Italian. In other words, he could write a text that would rival Boccaccio's text, Decameron. But he said, I want to write it about English people, and I want it to be read in England. Number two, he could have written it about the French, and therefore written it in French, because he was going to make fun of some French upper class, so maybe I'll write it in French. He was fluent in French. But again, he wanted to write it for people of England. Number three, he could have written it in Latin. He knew Latin. He could have written it in Latin because, are you ready for this? He's going to make fun of the church. He's going to poke fun at the church. But the only problem is that the only people who can read in Latin are the people in the church. And so he makes his final decision. He chooses to write in the language of these street people. <coughs> Later, it will be called... English. Here's the problem for Chaucer, though. When he gets ready to write this language that's an oral language, he's been hearing it, right? When he gets ready to write it, there's no spell checker. There's no dictionary. There's no grammar book about the rules of this language. Chaucer literally writes down the way the people speak. Are you ready for this? The bad spellers in the house are going to love this. He can spell the same word three different ways. It doesn't matter because there's, it's not like it's right or wrong. You got me? He will write down this language, and in the process, he will invent English. Whoa, that's a pivotal moment. Wait a minute. But wait a second. I thought we already said when we studied Beowulf that we looked at some language that I believe it was Mr. Paulson tried to read for us, but remember, he, he d had difficulty. Do you remember that on that packet? Do you remember? We looked at, well, do you remember what we call that? We called it Old English, didn't we? Old English. Now, if you are looking with me right now on page 97, we're going to give Paulson a chance to redeem himself. Right? We're going to give him a chance to redeem himself on page 97. And we're going to look at now... Chaucer's, are you ready for this? Middle English. So for your notes, we looked at Old English with Beowulf. We had to read in translation though, didn't we? Now we're going to look at Chaucer's Middle English, and Ricardo is excited, I can tell, to hear Paulson attempt to try to read this stuff. Now, Mr. Paulson, we're going to give you the attempt here to try to read this. Mr. Paulson says, I believe I deserve some plus points on my test sheet. Yes. I agree with you, Mr. Paulson. There you go. So let's make sure you read it well, though. All you're doing for us, Mr. Paulson, do you see lines 1 through 18 of the prologue at the very top? Now, I'm talking about the very, very top of the page on page 97, right? Do you see it? Now, hello, don't laugh at him, but follow along. Some of these words he's immediately going to get. Immediately. He's going to see him. He's going to immediately know what he's reading. Others of these words, he's going to have to guess at, right? Go ahead, Mr. Paulson, read for us. When that April with his sure suits the drought of March hath perched on to that roots, and bathe every vein in this in which liquor, but which virtue and gendered in is the flower. When Zephyrus speak with his sweet breath, inspired hath in every hope and heat. 
the tender crops and the young sun. Now, let's give him a hand. That's a fine job. He did a fine job. Let's have, hello. The word orthography means spelling. Did you notice these words, many of these words, he could tell that was the word sun, but do you see how it's spelled? He could tell that was the word crop. We live in an agriculture community, huh? But that's not the correct spelling of crop. Do what happened? We're looking at Middle English for your notes, for your notes. The next step in the standardization of this language is going to be Shakespeare. I'd, I'd like you to put this in your notes now on a little timeline. I won't even put it on the board because I've done this with you so many times. You ought to be able to do this yourself, right? You draw your line. You draw your zero. That's the birth of Christ. You go to the right of the zero in common era, right? And the first date you're going to write down is 1,000 common era. 1,000. At 1,000, you're going to write what title? For Old English, what are you going to write? You're going to write Beowulf. Excellent. Okay? At 1,000. Here, we're in 1350, so you're going to write that date down. Underneath that, you're going to write Chaucer, and you're going to write Middle English. Middle English. Finally, you're going to write one more date down, 1600. That we're going to call Modern English, and that's who? Right, that's Shakespeare. See, when you were a freshman, and you picked up Romeo and Juliet, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge, break to new mutiny, where civil hands make civil blood unclean, and all of that, right, okay? You were reading the very words of Shakespeare. And let's be fair, while it was maybe a challenge for you as freshmen initially, after a while you could read it and understand what was being said, right? And in fact, are you ready for this? This semester in Senior English 8, we will pick up more Shakespeare. We'll study poetry. We'll study plays of Shakespeare. We're reading the language that he wrote. That for us is already standardized by 1600. One more date to write down on that timeline. The real standardization of our English language finalized 1611. 1600, the year Shakespeare will write and produce Hamlet on stage, his greatest play. 1611, boy, does anybody know this? I will give plus points on a test sheet if anybody can tell me what's significant about 1611. The year 1611 is what important moment in the history of the English language. The volume that's published is called the Authorized Version. The dictionary? Close. It's not the dictionary. The What's the most important book in all of, in all of European? Bible. You're right. It is what we call the King James Version of the Bible. 1611, King James, the sitting king of England, will create this translation of the Bible, and that makes the English language what it is and what it sounds like. And in 1611, once that book is published, that's how people talk, that's how people write if you're doing this thing called English. Chaucer is the inventor of all of that. So we. Speak it now? I'm sorry, say it again. How do we get to like how we speak Right, it now? see, the question is a brilliant one. So wait a minute, 1611, <laughs> the King James Version of the Bible is published, and then a whole bunch of English people get on boats and start sailing across that little body of water we call the Atlantic Ocean, where they arrive on Plymouth Rock. And guess what volume they carry with them when they show up at Jamestown and afterwards? The King James Version of the Bible. You got it. So in English, if you were going to learn that language, the way you learned that language through primarily through the study of the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Do you got me? Okay? But all of that made possible because 300 years earlier, a guy named Chaucer decided to tell a story for Mr. Short and he decided to write it in the language that Mr. Paulson was just playing with now. Now, we will be working in translation. Boy, does it tell you something, Mr. Roth, you know that, years ago when Mr. McGee came to Room 303, when I taught Chaucer originally, the anthology that I taught from only had the language Paulson was just reading. That's all they provided. We didn't work in translation. We read all of the general prologue and two of the stories of Chaucer, in the original Middle English, believe it or not, Mr. Paulson, if you did it for a couple of days, you actually pick it up pretty quickly. And you'd start to be able to kind of guess at a lot of the spelling or the orthography, and you'd also be able to kind of figure out what was being said. We, however, are going to work in translation. It's going to be much easier for us. Got me?
Now what we'll be doing is looking at the opening lines of the general prologue, only we're going to be reading a translation. You are on page 97 with me. You have your notes in front of you. And we're going to now notice that this passage that we're going to look at is a when, 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 then construction. Three wins and a then. If you read it with me, you'll see what I'm talking about. Let's take a look, shall we? Here we go. When in April, are you reading it with me? Page 97. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, and all the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower, when also Zephyrus with his sweet breath exhales in air in every grove and heath upon the tender shoots, and the young sun is half horse and the sign of the ram is run, and the small fowl are making melody that sleep away the night with open eye. So nature pricks them, and their heart engages. Then people long to go on pilgrimages, and palmers long to seek the stranger strands of far-off saints hallowed in sundry lands. And especially from every shire's end in England, down to Canterbury they went to seek the holy blissful martyr, quick to give his help to them when they were sick. Now, I want to stay on page 97. And I want to help you to be able to read this. Now, one or two of us have started reading this. And we got to be fair to say it out loud. This ain't easy to read. Can I say that without insult? This ain't read, easy to read. Now, Mr. McGee, when you read this stuff, it starts to make a little bit more sense to me. You're right. you got to remember, though, see, I've been teaching this for a while, and so I have a sense of how to read it so that you can understand it. But an important point now to be made. Hello, I need all eyes on me to listen. I am very pleased that you're going to know something about Chaucer before we're done. And I'm very happy that you're going to know something about Middle English and the like. But we are here, first and foremost, to learn how to read. That is our state standard. We could do it with a biology text. We could do it with a mathematics text. We could do it with a history text. Okay, we could. But we're going to do it with literature. And more particularly now today, Chaucer. you got to concentrate and you got to really stay focused and I can help you learn how to read, okay? It is a skill set, just like any other skill set. Do you got me? So, let's work through it. And notice what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to read a couple of lines. We're going to put it in our own words. We're going to read a couple of more lines. We're going to put it in our own words. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So, let's work through it now, and at least work through the first 20 lines or so of the general prologue. Are we ready? I told you already, this is much easier if you understand this is a when, 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 then construction. Notice the first word. Do you see it? What's the first word? When. It is when. Notice what he'll say. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, and all the veins are bathed in liquor of such powers, brings about the engendering of the flower. First four lines, read it again, put it in your own words. What time of the year? Spring. Spring, April, right? What does he say about April that happens? It rains. it rains, good. And in so raining, what does it do? Waters the roots, right? And in the process of watering, bathing the liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. In other words, what do we say? In spring, it rains, and the flowers grow. Absolutely. Good, good, good. So that's the first four lines. In other words, he's going to say, in the spring, when everything comes back to life in terms of the green. Right? Look at the next wind. Starts on line five. Read it with me. When also Zephyrus, with his sweet breath, exhales in air in every grove and heath upon tender shoots, and the young sun is half course and the sign of the ram has run. Wait a minute. What's Zephyrus? So you can use your footnote here. It is, the wind. So in other words, the first wind is when it rains in the spring and everything starts to grow. What's the second wind? What happens also in the spring? The wind. The, the, right, the wind starts to blow. Zephyrus is the wind of the spring, right? That blows, okay? So he says, in the spring, when the rain happens, in the spring, when the wind blows, look at the next one. And here's the third wind. And... The small fowl are making a, a melody that sleep away the night with open eye. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Mr. Short, how do you sleep away the night with open eye? If you are sleeping away the night with open eye, what's the one thing you're not doing in the night? You're clearly not sleeping. 
Well, what is it that little animals do in the spring and the night if they're not sleeping? They're running around. Well, did you see your Bambi? Are you familiar? What is it called? Twitter painted, right? In other words, he says, what happens in the spring? It rains, the wind blows, everything grows, but what else happens? So nature pricks them and their heart engages. Whoa, whoa, Rothlund has figured it out. Yes, what happens in the spring? Yes, all the animals start hanky-panky. In other words, yes, in the spring. And who are you going to blame it on? You're going to blame it on nature. I mean, it's in their nature. All the animals start hanky-panking in the spring. In other words, everything wakes up. It's another way to say it, right? With the moisture of the rain and the wind... Everything wakes up. All the animals start hanky-panking. I mean, it's a fair question to ask. Why is MTV spring break in the spring? Like, dude, why don't they do it in, like, October? Yeah, but think about it. The places where people go for spring break, it's nice and warm where they go. Why do they do it in the spring? The answer, by the way, to that is because that's when the Greeks did it. Remember? The Greeks had their famous festival for theater in the... Spring, when you do all the planting festivals. So we're finally told that when all of that happens, finally, stay with me just for a second, then people long to go on pilgrimage. Right? And palmers long to seek the stranger strands of far off saints, hallowed in sundry lands. In other words, in the spring it rains, the wind blows, everything starts hanky panking, and people wake up and want to go on pilgrimage. We're going to be told tomorrow that Chaucer meets a group of people and decides to go on pilgrimage. Tomorrow we're going to introduce you to what we call Chaucer's Project. Thank you.